Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's brain series uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Frank Palou entitled What Makes Us Human. Thank you all for continuing to show up, showing up to our virtual events and continuing to support uh, the Zuckerman Institute. My name is Rick Costa, and I'm uh, the director here at, at the Zuckerman Institute. We hope that in the coming months, we'll be able to uh, resume uh, in these events in person. Uh, but for now, uh, we remain committed to bringing to you the outstanding science that's happening at the Zuckerman Institute. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, those of you who continue to support the good work of the Institute, and in particular tonight, the Palu Lab, and uh, for example, the Nomis Foundation that, who is uh, joining us here tonight. And I now have uh, the great pleasure of introducing you Dr. Frank Palou, an amazing scientist, a great friend and colleague. Frank did his undergrad and grad study, studies at Université Claude Bernard in, in Lyon, France, uh, where uh, he uh, obtained his PhD in 97. And following that, he joined uh, Dr. Arnie van Gosch's lab at, at Johns Hopkins University for a postdoctoral training. In 2002, Frank was hired as an assistant professor uh, in the Neuroscience Center uh, and Department of Pharmacology at UMC Chapel Hill. And he stayed there and climbed through the ranks until 2010 when he joined the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla in California. And then in late 2013, he was recruited here to Columbia uh, to the then newly formed, uh, still no building, uh, Mortimer Zuckerman Mind Brain uh, Behavior Institute. Throughout his career, uh, uh, Frank has focused on the identification of the molecular mechanisms underlying neuronal development in the mammalian brain, in, in, in both health and disease. And more recently, his lab has identified novel signaling pathways underlying synaptic loss during early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Frank has received several awards for his scientific contributions, including the Pew Scholar Award in Biomedical Research, uh, the NARSAD Young Investigator Award, and uh, Roger uh, the Spalberg Award in Neuroscience uh, in 2015. So tonight we'll have a conversation and we'll hear a bit about his career path, his discoveries, and, and, um, and Frank's research around identifying how genetic changes that are specific to humans may impact the assembly of this amazing machinery that's the brain, and further our understanding of neurodegenerative diseases. So before I ask Frank to join us, I wanna thank also all of you that submitted questions online uh, uh, ahead of time, and remind you that you have a little Q&A uh, box uh, uh, in your screen. Please submit questions throughout the, the, the conversation and then I'll make sure to pose them to uh, uh, Frank. So please now uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, to this virtual stage, Dr. Frank Ballou. Frank. Good evening, Rui. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah. So Frank, what an amazing trajectory. I mean, you're still relatively, uh, young, uh, but you've, you've been in many places. And um, so you were born in, in Lyon. And did you always know, I always ask this, did you know from when you were a kid that you wanted to be a scientist or how, how did this happen? Yeah, I, um, I, I had an inkling and, and an interest in science early on. Um, uh, probably when I was a teenager, I'll, I'll, I'll show some slides later on illustrating that point. Um, I, I was 
basically raised, you know, in, in a family where uh, no one in, in, in my surroundings, immediate uh, surroundings were, were academics or even went to university. I'm, I'm the first person in my, my entire extended family uh, to, to actually go to university. Uh, my parents were, you know, born in the 30s in France and, uh, you know, when, you know, experienced the war. And, and back then, you know, most people actually didn't even go all the way to the baccalaureate, right? Uh, they stopped at what was called in France, brevet des collèges. So they stopped basically at the, um, high, you know, entry of high school level and, and, and had to work, you know, early on. And so I had one aunt who, um, who became um, an English teacher, actually. Um, mm-hmm. but, but, you know, very few people. Um, so it, it was a foreign concept to me to actually study or even become a scientist until, until I, I, I discovered, uh, you know, uh, science, mostly through popular science magazines and uh, and and and, a, and an amazing biology teacher when I was um, when I was in high school when I was sixteen, uh, Miss Delba. She was uh, an extraordinary uh, biologist and you know bi- biology teacher and and yeah, I got hooked basically. Um, it was uh, you know uh, early amazing. early interest. Yeah, but, but so, back then, as I'll show, uh, you know, as I'll yeah, illustrate maybe with you some can pictures. show us a bit. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. I so was, uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, so you, you, <coughs> the, ah, this is, can, can you uh, see this? This is Lyon, yeah. Yeah, so I, I come from Lyon for people who don't know this city, it's a, it's a beautiful city. Um, in the middle of France, basically halfway between Paris and the, uh, the Mediterranean coast. Um, it's a very old city. It's 2000 years old. It's a Roman city. The uh, Romans called it Lugdunum. Um, it's a city built around two rivers, basically at the confluence of two rivers. It's, it's, it's really a beautiful city. If you've never uh, visited, uh, I totally encourage you to, um, to, to do so. Um, Lyon is, is probably most famous from, for gastronomy. It's uh, still considered the, the French capital of, um, of gastronomy. Um, there are very famous restaurants like Paul Bocuse. There's actually um, um, uh, like a contest, like an like a international um, uh, culinary contest every year. Um, <laughs> and there are fantastic restaurants. But... Um, Lyon is also pretty well known for, for its university. Uh, its university, uh, as you mentioned, is called uh, Université Claude Bernard in, in recognition of, of um, an amazing physiologist, um, you know, from the 19th century, in, uh, early 1800s, um, defined basically experimental physiology, right? And, and um, uh, among many other contributions define what's co- what was later called uh, homeostasis, basically. Homeostasis, called yeah. Milieu interior. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, an amazing, a towering figure. And, and he's, you know, he's very, very famous in, in Lyon. He was born and raised in Lyon. Um, and then, yeah, as, yeah. as you mentioned before, you know, my, my interest really started when, when I... Uh, by serendipity, basically, my grandfather, my, my dad's dad, uh, I discovered when I was 13 or 12 or 13, had a big stash of this magazine called Science et Vie. It's a very old publication, uh, French publication, sort of a, the equivalent of Scientific American. Scientific basically. American here, right? Yeah, I used it's, to it's, read uh, this in Portugal. <laughs> because yeah, at exactly. the time we didn't and, get and, Scientific American, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and it... Um, I discovered this stash basically in, in his attic and he had literally hundreds of those magazines and, and it had a, a big impact on me. I started, you know, reading, you know, I asked him if I could read them. And, and this, this publication, you know, started in, in 1913. So there was, you know, there's a lot of history there. Um, it started with, you know, France is very strong in engineering and, 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 and science um, it started mostly, you know, depicting the, the wonders of the, the Industrial Revolution. And, but to this day, it's actually, you know, very active and, and fascinating, uh, fascinating publication. And I, I, I read this avidly. Um, but interestingly, back then, I have to admit that, you know, um, 
nobody in my family or, or, or among my friends thought that I would become a scientist. Um, you know, I was mostly interested in sports. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I did a lot of uh, basketball, tennis. My father was, was a, you know, a pretty sporty person. And, and, um, and I even did some triathlons, you know, some, some crazy, crazy stuff. And, um, and so, but, but everything changed literally uh, when I was 17. I read this absolutely amazing ah. book. If you haven't read uh, this so book. So, Francois I, I, Jacob, eh? Yeah, this. it's... Um, this, this book by François Jacob called La Logique du Vivant, The Logic of the Living. It's an amazing, absolutely amazing book. Uh, it's a history of biology uh, mixed with uh, philosophy of science. And, and it's a profound book. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really amazing. And he wrote this and, and other books. As, as you probably know, François Jacob, uh, Jacques Monod, and André Lvoff um, won the Nobel Prize in 1965, uh, probably about 10 years after their, their main discoveries of the, um, of the genetic mechanisms uh, it, uh, allowing bacteria to, uh, to, you know, to have homeostas- homeostatic responses, basically to respond to, the, to changes in their environment. And, um, and François Jacob and Jacques Monod, both of them were, you know, my idols when when I when I grew up, uh, not only because of their scientific contribution <coughs> contributions, but because they they had an active role in in the resi- resistance, you know, during the Second World War, um, mm-hmm. and they become you know uh, towering political figures also in in France. Um, so yeah, here that that's that's this, my this background. Book, uh, yeah, this is amazing because this book, I mean, for you it must be different because you read it in the original <laughs> in French but this yeah. book many many then um, you know the the a golden age of molecular biology including some of our colleagues that then came to work on gene cloning and the whole machinery this book and the translation in English influenced the whole generation of, of absolutely people, right? absolutely there are you know, two books Exactly. There, there are two books published by Jacob um, and one by Jacob and Mono. Uh, the other one is, is called Hazard et Necessité, Necessity and, and, yes. and Chance. And Those chance. two books are, are, were foundational. And I think for a lot of good reasons, you're, you're totally right that, you know, what's amazing about their research is that they did major discoveries with very limited tools. In the 50s, yeah. most of the discoveries of how bacteria uh, of the genetic mechanisms that they hypothesize underlies the ability of bacteria to, you know, to change their growth patterns in response to, you know, uh, changing their milieu, um, w- was before the birth of, of molecular biology. <laughs> yes. is, you know, they, they, they had basically no tools. Everything they, they discovered was based on careful experimental, um, you know, settings and deduction and, and thinking. It's, it's actually very impressive. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's then, very impressive what thinking and can so do. So that, that, that book really, you know, the, what was amazing about that book when I read it is that I, I found it fascinating. I also found, you know, many parts obscure because I was 17 and I, I, there are many parts in there that I did not understand. And I made a promise to myself that I would, uh, you know, go to university, work hard and, and do everything I could to actually understand every single word and every single concept in that book. I was a you know my own child uh, basically, and then so so that yes. triggered my interest in biology. The the, the interest in neuroscience in general uh, came from from a couple of, of uh, uh, reviews that were published actually in Scientific American. I had access to this when I joined uh, university, um, including this absolutely beautiful review by Maxwell Cohen. Um, who depicted what we knew at that time, the work of, um, of Angevin, of Pascal Rakish, you know, on how neurons are born in the brain, how the brain is becoming self-assembled, right? And, and I was, when I read these reviews, I was absolutely, uh, absolutely hooked. I mean, I, 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 yeah. I, I read those reviews just before uh, uh, choosing my PhD lab, uh, basically. And, and the, the person who introduced me to these topics what, uh, ended up being my PhD advisor, Henry Kennedy. Uh, oh wow! And uh, you you work precisely on 
on development, right? Uh, in your that's PhD. right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I became really fascinated in 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 how such a complex structure, uh, you know, uh, develops and 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 becomes self-assembled. Basically, what are the instructions at the molecular and cell level that uh, allows you know billions of neurons to become connected in a precise fashion? And that 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 basically triggered you know the interest um, for the rest of my and, career. And it's still a, a question that mesmerizes. I mean, with a, as many synaptic connections as maybe stars in the universe on each human yeah. brain, how does this That's happen? Right. <laughs> and you That's went right. on to to study specialization yeah, and, 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 you know, right? To, in your to illustrate. That's yeah. right. To illustrate that point, actually, I, I, I put this figure together. I, 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 I love this figure. It, 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 um, it was depicted in, in a uh, beautiful review by Wittwig Denk and, and Jeff Lichtman uh, maybe a decade ago. Um, and I think it illustrates the, you know, the challenges of studying the brain and, and why, you know, to this day, we still understand little about, you know, how the brain is, is, is self-assembled, but, but ultimately how it functions, right? I think the, the biggest challenge, we talk about this often together and, and with other colleagues at, at, uh, at Columbia, um, is what's challenging is, is the different scales of organization, right? So you can study the brain as, as the human brain or, or the mouse brain at, at you know, multiple scales at the whole um, brain level, right? Um, visualizing, we have colleagues here, right? Uh, like Dr. Nashami and, and many others that study how the brain you know, functions at, at the whole uh, brain level, right? Uh, but then ultimately, if you want to dive down into the circuits that, that generate thoughts, right, and, and percept and, and motor control, you have to dive down into the basic units of information, right, um, neurons, right, inside the brain. And those, um, you know, those, those are much smaller uh, in scales, of course, right, in, in the hundreds of microns or millimeter, right, a uh, couple of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. tens or hundreds of an inches. Um, if you want to study how those neurons communicate, you have to, you know, study synapses, right? So you can visualize synapses as those spines. I'll, I'll talk a lot about, um, you know, synapses in, in the rest of the, the presentation. Uh, but then if you really want to go even deeper and understand how synapses function, right? You have to go down to even smaller scales, down to the scales of individual synapses that you can only visualize basically with, uh, you know, electron microscopy techniques. Um, nowadays, there, there are techniques even using light microscopy that, that allows you to get to that resolution. But that's not the final scale, right? The final scale is really molecular scales. Like the, the, the molecules that operate at synapses are in the tens of nanometer scale, right? And, and we now have techniques to actually visualize those, those proteins. This is the famous... Um, Ampar receptor uh, subunits, tetramer, right? Uh, and that, that basically, you know, it's in the tens of nanometer scale. So there's, there's basically um, a couple of million uh, uh, orders of, uh, you know, basically a thousand order of magnitude, you know, differences between uh, studying the brain at the molecular level versus the, the whole brain level. And I, I, I found this absolutely both fascinating and frightening. I mean, it, it, it's really... Um, challenging to study, you know, the brain at those different scales. But I think, you know, especially at ZI, one of the things that motivated me to come here is that we have the power now, the, the technologies to 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 tackle those um, the brain at those different scales of organization. And I think that that's really uh, that that's really fascinating. And, and the Absolutely. past the past couple of decades have have you know clearly revolutionized our our. Um, our understanding of how the brain functions, right? Um, but to come back to, um, to, to, to numbers, because I, I, yes. I, I tend to be very uh, quantitative and I like numbers, right? So you, you probably all read, uh, you know, numbers like this and the fact that, you know, we have about more than 85 billion neurons in, in, our, in, in, in our brain. We have um, about a trillion synapses in, in our brain. Most of those neurons can form somewhere between 1,000 to 10,000 synaptic contact with other neurons, right? And, and so th those numbers are staggering. As you mentioned, you know, there, there, we have more synapses in our brain than, than stars in the universe, right? So, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really mind-boggling, right? Um, 
And so um, when I when I decided, you know, to to start my PhD, I joined the lab of um, Henry Kennedy and Colette Dehay and it, at um, Inser Munich in, in Lyon, um, where I studied um, 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 a peculiar question, which was. Uh, if you want to understand basically how the brain, um, uh, how neurons become what they need to be, right? And where they need to project, for example, how they form connection. The question we asked is, do they receive information from their final environments, right? Um, especially in the cortex, um, neurons are, are uh, aligned basically in layers. They're very well organized in layers. And we asked this, you know, what seemed at the time a, a simple question, which was, um, if you find a mutation, and we did so, um, we, we, we analyzed a, a mutant mouse called the Wheeler uh, mutant, where uh, neurons are, are um, failed to be instructed to reach the right layer. So you can see that those, those white dots here are individual neurons that project to the spinal cord, so-called cortical spinal projection neurons. So in a wild type animal, they're only in layer five, right? Beautifully aligned, basically. Mm -hmm. But in this mutant, they're completely all over the place. And what we discovered using this um, these studies uh, during my PhD is that if you if that we, we basically discovered that they're uh, generated in the in abnormal numbers basically, and so that in fact there's probably a uh, feedback from their uh, final environment instructing how many of them should be generated basically uh, by progenitors. So this was this was the you know the the the, the basic aspect of my. Uh, humble beginnings uh, during my PhD. That's and then um, those images. And then, and then you, you went to Johns Hopkins, but there's you, a young- You mentioned that I, I, I decided to do my postdoc at Hopkins. I was extremely fortunate to meet um, Anna van Gosh, uh, who became, you know, who, who's a, an amazing scientist, but became a, a close friend too. Um, and I met Anavan in 96 at, at, at an SFN meeting. And, and back then I looked like this. Um, and despite my, you know, uh, <laughs> my uh, questionable um, uh, looks, I, <laughs> Anavan decided to, to, um, to offer me a position in his lab. And I was very fortunate for a couple of reasons, not only because, you know, Anavan turned out to be an, an amazing scientist. He was just finishing his postdoc uh, in my Greenberg's lab at Harvard. And, and so I, I joined his lab. I was his first postdoc, basically. And so I joined his lab when he, we were still putting the lab together. And this was a, you know, a great experience. Um, and during my PhD, I, I, I pursued this, the, the, the similar questions, basically, uh, that I asked for my PhD, but at, at a molecular, using molecular and cellular tools. Um, and I studied you know, uh, this phenomenon of, of axon and dendrite guidance. So you, you, you probably all know that neurons communicates with other neurons by sending an axon, which is a long projection that uh, connects other neurons and, and mediates, you know, and propagates information. And those axons make synapses onto the dendrites of, of other neurons. So neurons are very polarized cells. They're beautiful. They're the, the biggest cells in your body, basically. They're, and they're incredibly um, uh, polarized, right? And so we asked a very simple question back then, because we didn't know the answer to this question, which was that, how are neurons basically um, polarized and patterned? How do they um, uh, decide where to grow an axon and where to grow a dendrite, basically? That, that's really the question. And we developed this, this interesting essay where we, um, instead of plating neurons in culture or studying them in, in vivo, we, we developed this essay where we would plate um, neurons on top of a slice, basically. We would sprinkle those neurons on top of a cortical slice. And we asked a specific question, what, what would happen then? Because basically this assay, in this assay, you bypass the need for migration, for, um, you know, th this is a, an artificial assay, asking basically if those neurons had, had a, a compass or did they respond to extracellular cues basically that would pattern their dendrites and axon outgrowth. And within, within six months after I joined the po my postdoc, I, I obtained this picture, which basically changed everything <laughs> for me. <laughs> Uh, which was pretty amazing. Three hours after you played those neurons onto the slices, you see that every single one of those neurons has a little axon that grows back, basically, um, and is, uh, as you can probably right see, you barely need any quantification. All those, those little uh, protrusions, those axons, are directed downwards, right? Directed and, and mimicking what the endogenous neurons do. And we wanted to show that that those those axon patterning, basically the, the directionality of this axon outgrowth, 
is mediated by extracellular cues and we identified what those cues were. Uh, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But this was not this was not all. So we published a first paper describing this assay and describing the cues that might participate to this. But this is only three hours after you play the neurons. If you wait uh, three days, they form a dendrite that's directed the opposite way, that's directed up, basically. And, and uh, this was pretty remarkable back then. I mean, we, we, we didn't think back then, this was the first time somebody proposed, there was a, an emerging field in, in 96, there was the first meeting on, on axon guidance. So this was an emerging mm -hmm. field. But nobody knew that, that dendrites could be guided too, basically. So we, we coined the term dendritic guidance for uh, following this work. And, and, um, and for the next 10 years, I basically, um, at the end of my postdoc and, and, and throughout, you know, when I was at UNC Chapel Hill, when I, when I started my independent career, we, we basically uh, identified several of the molecular mechanisms that underlie this polarization of axon and dendrite patterning, basically. The surprise was was basically that the same cue, this this uh, this extracellular cue called semaphorin 3A here, uh, is expressed in a gradient in the cortex, and 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 this um, this gradient um, uh, is basically uh, this molecule is repulsive for the axons, instructing the axons mm -hmm. to grow away from from the source of this gradient, and and at the same time the same cell. Uh, the dendrite, uh, the leading process that becomes the dendrite of this cell is attracted to this, to this cue. And so it suggested that the same cell can respond in a completely opposite manner right, to the same extracellular cue. And, and we figured out how the cell does that. I'm not going to get into the details. It, it has to do with some sort of internal compass inside the cell that actually um, uh, allows the dendrite to be attracted and the axon to be repulsed by the same cue. And, and then we went on to do a lot of other work on, on this topic. So this was, you know, the first, yeah, I would say 10 years of my independent career, um, mostly, uh, you know, during my postdoc and, and, um, and, and then at, and then at UNC. And then you went yeah, to Scripps and at one point you're, you're happy at Scripps and, <laughs> and you have a dinner with the late Tom Jessel that came to visit, right? That's right. That's right. I, I still remember that that dinner. You know, I was uh, I admired uh, Tom's uh, science. You know, for for a very long time. And, you know, I could have started a, a fan club basically. <laughs> um, I, I remember uh, him giving him a first talk to the very first Gordon conference I I, I went to in uh, in '96. So you know, when I started my postdoc and, you know, he gave this absolutely amazing talk on, you know, spinal cord patterning and cell type specification. I was, I was really um, uh, in complete admiration. Um, and then, so, so Tom was on the board, the scientific advisory board of the Salk Institute, uh, was at, at uh, in Sandy, at La Jolla in San Diego. And, um, and I, I think he, he, he was coming to a board and, and we had a, we, we had a nice dinner and, and he, he mentioned um, that uh, you know they 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 had this big initiative to to create the Zuckerman Membrane Behavior Institute and um, and and I was hooked. I was only you know at Scripps for three years back then. I, I didn't expect I would I would move again, um, but I I was definitely uh, you know very attracted to to the idea of of being part of this project and and I think it will become obvious why um, in in the next few slides. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So then you joined and tell us about the science you've been doing. Then let's say in the next in the in the in the in in, in the next ten years. Ten years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> so so you know the purpose of the talk tonight is is really you know. Um, to, to, to try to tackle this question of what makes us human. And, and so we started this uh, right um, in 2010. So, you know, a couple of years before I joined uh, Colombia. Um, and, and, and it, it, you know, it's, we're trying to identify, we're geneticists at heart. So we're trying to identify genes that might, um, that might contribute to um, specific aspect of human brain development, right? And, and so I'm, I'm going to tell you more about this um, uh, now, so you know, this is a big question. It's probably one of the biggest questions in biology, but in neuroscience in particular, you know, the question of what makes our brain human specific, what what distinguishes us to our closest living relatives, right, chimpanzees that we diverged from uh, our common ancestor about you know six or seven million years ago, right? This is a fascinating question, right, from an evolutionary standpoint. Uh, 
um, something happened in our genome that instructed, you know, a specific aspect of brain development that, that makes us unique that, you know, that's the bottom line. Right. And, um, and so, so this, this is also illustrated, you know, I, I don't think I, I will have to convince uh, the, you know, the audience in what makes us unique. Right. But I think one of the most unique thing that I always portray is, is our ability, uh, you know, to for create, you know, our amazing abilities for creative thinking, for um, for uh, representational arts, right? Um, this is this absolutely beautiful paintings from uh, the Chauvet cave. And there's about sixty caves, basically, in France and the rest of Europe, um, uh, from the um, Onyassian uh, period. Um, you know, somewhere between forty to twenty thousand uh, uh, years ago. Uh, and these paintings are, are absolutely amazing. It's amazing. And, and this is the product of Homo sapiens, um, really. You know, the, when you look at the details on, on these cave paintings, um, humans have come back to this cave for, you know, two to 3,000 years. It's pretty amazing. But the techniques didn't evolve much, but, but were, you know, amazing in complexity. Uh, the, this is uh, depicting a, a species that lived in Europe back then, but that's extinct now, um, the woolly rhinos. Um, and, and it's thought that the, the, the art historians that basically studied this in great details think that this, this is an attempt to depict the movement of these rhinos. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty mind boggling to think that people already there, right? It's Homo sapiens uh, close to 30,000 years ago had the, the urge to to create and to depict this, right? And I think that's one of the many things that makes us, uh, that makes us yeah, unique. Yeah, it's right? fascinating. Uh, and so, so if we come back to, you know, our, our um, ev human evolution uh, uh, and, and human history, right? Uh, the timeline is, is based on, you know, decades of absolutely amazing work uh, uh, by, um, by mostly um, anthropologists and uh, paleontologists, right? Uh, suggest that um, you know we diverge from our common ancestors um, with with other uh, non human primates about six million years ago. Uh, so the birth of the Homo lineage basically happened sometime four to two point five million years ago, at a transition between Australopithecus and Homo habilis. That that's you know very massive oversimplification, right? And then um, starting with Homo habilis and, and for, for the next 2 million years, this massive um, uh, expansion of, of the brain size, right? But interestingly, brain size best correlates to body size, even among all mammals, right? So for example, dolphins have you know, a degree of uncivilization that's closely related to, to modern humans, right? Um, and so, so when you think about trying to, 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 to hypothesize what could make us unique, and I think the, the, what I'm going to conclude is that we don't know. That's why we're, we're trying to study this from a genetic standpoint. Many, you, many mammalian species have succeeded at expanding the brain, right? So brain size cannot be the answer. It's probably an important evolutionary step, but it cannot be the only answer, right? Because um, compared to other non mammalian species, right, including... Uh, tortoises, uh, elephants, dolphins, um, you know, we, 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 we're not completely exceptional from this standpoint, right? Um, so what else could, could, could define our brain, right? And, and, and so we hypothesized, we and, and many others hypothesized uh, without much data back then, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, that, that neuronal composition, there might be new neuronal populations, or at least there might be subtle changes in, in the relative proportion of different neurons types, right, in the brain. But I think that the, 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 one of the most uh, exciting possibilities that connectivity is different, right, uh, in the brain. And, um, and that the total number of synapses, right, this fundamental unit of communication between neurons, um, is is different, and for that we do have data. So I'll I'll, I'll skip the um, the most of the introductory material. For that we have very precise quantitative data. So this is a beautiful work from Chet Sherwood, uh, an amazing uh, non-primate uh, uh, anthropologist, that have uh, painstakingly counted synapses, basically in twenty-five uh, non-human primate species and and humans, in, including non-human our closest, uh, uh, you know, living relatives, uh, bonobos and, and, and uh, chimpanzees. And, and it's pretty clear that if you, if you uh, plot uh, the number of neurons per, the number of synapses per neurons, right, the number of connections that neurons make, 
um, uh, human uh, cortical pyramidal neurons are complete outliers, right? Uh, we're, we're off the charts, basically, in terms of number of connections per neuron, right? So the central question that, that we're asking, um, you know, that we've been asking for the past um, 10, 12 years is what, is what are the genetic and molecular uh, substrates underlying the emergence of human specific features of connectivity in the brain? That, that's really uh, what, what our contribution to understanding, you know, trying to, to improve our understanding of what makes us human, right? And so this all started from, and, and for many years, uh, we were stuck. When I say we, um, myself and a couple of colleagues, a very close colleague of mine, Pierre van der Hagen, who's a professor of neuroscience also in, in, uh, in Belgium, uh, we've been, you know, pondering with this question, but we didn't have a, a mean to actually tackle this question until mm -hmm. uh, 2008, 2010, at the completion of the you know, human genome sequencing. Um, the, the sequencing was, was a high enough quality to actually map um, the, the final 1% of the human genome that is specific to, 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 to us. That, that is, this 1% of the human genome is not found, contains gene and gene copies, basically, the so-called gene duplication, that are not found in any other non-human non primates or any other mammalian species, right? So this is the 1% of our genome that defines mm -hmm. us, at least, you know, oversimplified. Um, and so when we looked at that list, surprise, two things emerged, basically. The first thing is that it's a limited number of genes, of protein-coding genes in that 1%. It's about 30 genes. This is not a complete list, but about 30 genes in that, in, in that list. And the second um, uh, thing that, that we concluded from this is that we actually knew the function of almost none of those genes. So, so, so you know, we had a lot of work of, ahead of us, right? And um, the first thing that caught our attention in, 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 in this list, actually, we, were, we started working on in 2008 when we discovered those papers, the uh, gene sr gap that I'm going to tell you a bit more about. And so the, the, we, we came up with a new paradigm, basically, to, to study this, right? Because it's kind of a crazy question, right? When, 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 you talk, when I talk to people and... and you know, I try to explain to them what we do in the lab, basically. Um, when I try to tell them that we're interested in identifying what makes our brain unique, you know, it's, it's like, a, well, that's a, that's a big question, right? So how do you tackle it? So we tackle it uh, using this human-specific gene duplication as a, as a tool, right, to, to probe this, uh, these potential differences. So the first question that came to mind was, which which one of those of those genes are actually expressed in the human brain, right? Because it's possible that some of those genes are not even expressed in the brain, right? So um, they might contribute to other traits that distinguishes us uh, from uh, evolutionary, right? Such as um, skeletal, you know, um, uh, skeletal patterning or other things. The second question is, what is the function of the ancestral copy? I briefly mentioned that we actually didn't know the function of most of those genes. SRG2 was the exception. And then the most fascinating question is, of course, what is the function of the human-specific copy of these genes, right? Is it, is, is, are, are those human-specific copies um, functioning in a way related to the ancestral copy? Or are, um, have, they, have some of them been what's called neo-functionalized? Have they, have they acquired a function independent, a completely novel function, independent of, of the ancestral copy of this gene that's shared among all mammals? Right? So the, 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 we, we, we now know a lot about those genes. Back in 2008, when we started this project, we, we actually didn't know when those genes emerged. Using um, uh, sort of uh, genetic dating, there's a way to actually, based on rate of mutation and, and other genetic process, you can actually date when those genes must have emerged, basically. And so the particular gene we're interested in, uh, SRGAP2C, I'll tell you a little bit about this gene, that human-specific copy of this gene emerged about 2.4 million years ago. 2.4 million years ago, 2.5 million years ago is actually a very interesting time point because it's a time point that corresponds to the emergence of the Homo lineage. But it, interestingly, it's before the main phase of brain expansion, right? And so um, we were really fascinated by, by, by this uh, dating. Um, and so the paradigm really that, that we, we decided to pursue, right, is the following. Most uh, people in, in neuroscience are interested in, in the you know, the, 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 the relationship between genes, how genes shape circuits and how circuits, you know, control behavior, behavioral performance. 
uh, we're adding sort of um, two layers to this, right? We're specifically interested in those human specific genes and we're tackling how these genes modify circuit function and maybe behavior using the, the power of the awesome power of uh, cell and molecular biology, right? Um, this is really, this is the, the experimental paradigm, right? So what have we found? Okay, so, so for SR gap two, I'm gonna summarize, you know, about a decade of work basically in, in this slide. <laughs> This whole project was was uh, was started by two amazingly talented um, uh, postdocs in my lab, Cécile Charrier, who now has um, her own lab at um, ENS in École Normale Supérieure in Paris. She's very successful, very um, independent, and Kamudi Joshi, who um, joined Genentech a few years ago. So what we discovered is essentially that the ancestral copy of this gene, this uh, called SRGAP2A. This, this gene is shared among all mammals. In fact, it dates back to, um, you know, to, to early vertebrates. Um, this gene basically is found at synapses only uh, in, 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 post in neurons. And it controls, it, it has two main effects, basically. It limits the total number of synapses neurons can make. And it actually um, uh, accelerates or, or promotes their maturation, the speed at which the synapses become functional. Right. That's so it, it, it accelerates the development of synapses, but but at the same time, it, it's a break. It puts a break on the total number of synapses neurons can make. And what we discovered is that if you partially inactivate SRGAP2A or if you express the human specific copy of this gene, which uh, which is a truncated version of, of the gene, it's a small uh, portion, you get the same result. You, you basically SRGAP2C inhibits the function of SRGAP2A. And the result is actually pretty, pretty striking. Those neurons form, form many more synapses, both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Those synapses are, are much uh, slower at maturing and, and, and there's also some interesting changes in, in their morphology. And so we published this first paper in 2012. And the reason I think why this paper was pretty well received was that we know that those, those two features, right, this delayed synaptic maturation, so it, it's a phenomenon called neoteny, right, uh, retention of juvenile features for much longer periods of time, and increased number of synapses are two cardinal features distinguishes, dis, distinguishing sure. human neurons, right? So we knew that just implementing this single genetic change had a profound impact on, on neural connectivity, and this was, you know, really, really exciting, right? And so this was basically the state of, um, of, of our knowledge in 2012, ju just before I, I decided to join Colombia. And the reason why we decided that this was, uh, that the reason I decided it was important for me to move to, to Colombia and in particular to, to the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute was that we wanted to go beyond just this description of you know, the molecular and cellular effects of this human specific gene duplication to actually understand the next question, right? I'll just skip those slides. So you probably don't need to, to hear that. The central question we asked, and when I say we, you know, it's convenient because it's mostly this uh, also amazingly talented uh, postdoc in my lab, Ival Schmidt. The question he asked was, where is this increased connectivity coming from, right? I mean, basically we're saying that those neurons receive 40, 50% more synapses. Where is this connectivity coming from? And even more importantly, what's the impact of this increased connectivity on circuit function and behavior, right? On behavior, yeah. And, and, and that's, those are hard questions to, to, to answer as, as, as you know more than, uh, better yeah. than anybody else. And I mean, right? it's, it's, very, it's very hard because so far, and I know you'll get into this, one of the difficulties is when you find these genes, right? Typically, we like to take them away, uh, put them back, uh, mutate them. But in the human, we can't do much. So we're going to get we, into we can't how really do that. Could, I'll, I'll show you yeah. at the very end that we have a way now to interrogate to do, the function of those genes in human neurons. Uh, that's a, that's uh, a very cool. recent development. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly touch, yeah. touch upon that. But, but this in the meantime, delayed we, maturation must be, you know, at the same time, it's like, it's a, it's a more densely, I mean, those, those synaptic connections are even more dense than in other brains, but they take, right. take longer in a way to, to exactly. form, which exactly. in a, it may be important, right? Because you don't want to, uh, 
increase the density and miss wire, right? Have everything like right away Absolutely. connect. Absolutely. Uh, In fact, when, when, when we started this project, I remember <laughs> I presented this data uh, in 2012, probably when a paper was published, the first paper was published at, at a meeting and, and, and the, the feedback I got from, from people who study circuit, you know, circuit function for a living, said that those mice are going to be completely screwed up, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're basically <laughs> changing, you know, synaptic connectivity in the cortex in, in an uncontrolled way. So I'm going to try to convince you, and we just published a paper in, in Nature that I, that I think, and a series of other papers, I'm going to try to convince you that there's, there's nothing screwed up in those mice. In fact, we think that, you know, we have tangible evidence suggesting that this gene induces some circuit changes that that are that that are really interesting and, and actually improve uh, uh, you know circuit function, but but even improve behavioral performance. Right. So I'm gonna uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna skip a few slides. Um, and but but you know, Ewald basically uh, with the help of um, of um, of my colleague uh, of our colleague Attila Dzanski at at ZI, uh, who um, basically adapted a technique that was developed by Ed Calloway at, at Salk. Attila developed this, um, this beautiful tech, this new rabies virus, basically. It's a, it's a viral technique that allows you, uh, using genetic engineering, to trace the connectivity of neurons, uh, you know, of, of, of a limited number of neurons. In this case, um, we, we, we did this experiment, Ewald did this experiment very quantitatively. We have some uh, some brains where there's a single so-called starter neuron, and all the, the neurons in magenta here are, we know, are monosynaptically connected to that cell. So we can map the input of this single neuron in the entire brain of the animal. And, and we also had to develop computational methods to actually register this in, in a common reference atlas. We've, uh, we've, we've, we've uh, collaborated with the Alan Brain Institute on this, and, and Ivan wrote a lot of code basically to do this. Um, so this is one example. We we have you know uh, tens of of, of, uh, of brains like this, but this is an example of a, a brain where there's a single starter neuron, and we can map the distribution throughout the entire brain of all the neurons that make connections to that single starter neuron, right? So so um, and and the big discovery that's you know summarized in in this single slide that's um, you know three years of work um, that that Ewald just made is that. Essentially, the increase in connectivity mostly comes from what's called cortical cortical connections. So connections okay. that come from other um, cortical neurons, basically. But interestingly, other types of, cortic of, of, of uh, connectivity of inputs are not changed. So connectivity coming from the thalamus, right, from outside the cortex is not changed, right? So the, it's actually very precise um, a change and very synapse specific uh, in, increase in, in, in cortical cortical connectivity. So it's summarized basically all the results are, um, are summarized on, on, on this single slide where um, using genetic engineering and, and, and synaptic tracing, we, we were able to identify that when we humanize, when we introduce this human specific gene in pyramidal neurons, we specifically increase the number of connections they receive. We, we you know, more than double the number of connections they receive from other cortical uh, neurons, right? Which is very interesting because we think that that's also um, a primate and a specific feature. And uh, in fact, there's data now suggesting that this increased cortical, cortical connectivity is, you know, defining feature in, in, in human neurons. And so um, the next thing we, we asked in, 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 with great help from uh, Darcy Paterka, you know, the, our, uh, our esteemed colleague uh, who leads the charge on technology development, right, on the cellular imaging core uh, at ZI, uh, was, you know, probing circuit function, right? And we did, we do this with, um, in vivo techniques where we can image the, the, the response properties of, of neurons in, in, uh, in the brain of, of mice where we introduce this gene. I, I'll spare you the details. So we get you know, beautiful movies like this where we can, we can probe the function and, and the, the activity of neurons uh, just following sensory stimulation, something very simple basically uh, in those mice. And what we discovered, uh, and we got great help here uh, from two incredibly talented uh, computational um, uh, postdocs from mm -hmm. Ken Miller's lab, Mario and Mauro, is that um, in wild type, if you look at um, the effect of sensory stimulation, so the, the two vertical bars here are before, during, and after sensory stimulation, you can see that in red, th those are all the neurons that are activated by, uh, 
you know, sensory stimulation, in this case, you know, whisker stimulation. And in blue, you see all the neurons that are inhibited by the same uh, stimulation, right? So this is in a wild type mouse. And this is what we found in, in, the, in, in mice where we introduced this gene when we increase cortical cortical connectivity. What you see is very interesting. You, the emergent property of, of uh, humanizing for SRGAP2C in the circuits is that you increase the proportion of neurons that are activated by the sensory stimulation, but you, you at, at, at the cost of decreasing the, the fraction of neurons that are inhibited, right? So, so it's actually really interesting, right? And, uh, we, we, we postulated based on some computational work that Mayo and Mao did, that this is really mostly the effect of increasing this local connectivity within, um, within the cortex, the, the bulk of the connectivity that comes from so-called recurrent excitation, right? So, 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 so recurrent networks that excite each other, more of those in the cortex. So the input is the same from subcortex, but these, the information is, um, Exactly. And excitatory it, it, information, information not processing, inhibitory. especially from, from this layer four to layer uh, two, three, we think the increase in these connections seems to explain a, a large part of the effect where those neurons become um, uh, better sensory coders, basically. That, that's that's the, in, in the nutshell. And so are so, they better? Are the mice better? That's right. So that's the next question. So so there we were stuck for for a long time, actually, for you know, about a year in trying to uh, ask the question of how do you measure if this effects in changing cortical connectivity and, and changing the response properties of those neurons has an impact on, on, on behavioral performance, right? And this is hard to do in mice. Uh, simply because most of the behavior, the, the, the behavioral tasks that people use in mice, wild-type mice are already very good at it and uh, at those tasks. And it's actually you know, difficult to, to, to measure a potential improvement in behavioral performance. We're very lucky, again, very fortunate being at, 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 um, as, at ZI, um, that our colleague, Randy Bruno, basically had developed a, a really interesting task. Um, it's called a sensory discrimination task. It's a very artificial task for, for mice. Um, where mice are, um, uh, have to learn to um, associate um, a texture, right? You can see that the, they're presented either this uh, rough texture or this rather slightly smoother texture, but those textures are very close to one another. And, and with their whiskers, um, they have to associate this texture with a decision, right? The decision is lick left or lick right for um, a small water reward. This is a Think about it. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever tried this. Even if you touch the it's textures tough. with your own finger and you close your eyes, right? You just rely on, on sensory touch basically for this. It's actually not that easy to distinguish those two textures. So believe it or not, this task is, is very hard for wild type animals. And this is why we did this task, right? And um, they learn the task, but it takes 50 training sessions for wild type animals to learn the task. And, and the most amazing result we got was basically that um, the SRGAP2C mice, the, the mice humanized for this gene, um, learned the task better and, and a larger proportion of them. Only 60% of the wild type mice ever learned the task, even after 50 training sessions, right? All, close to 90% of the, 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 the mice humanized for 2C learn the task, right? So there is a very, very significant and measurable impact on improving behavior or performance. In this case, you know, learning this complex sort of sensory discrimination mm -hmm. task. So, so yeah, so, so this, is, this is where we are right now. And I, I just want to uh, point to the fact that, you know, what, what's the future for this project? We're continuing to work on SRGAP2 because there's many uh, questions we still haven't answered. But, but of course, I mentioned at the beginning that this is only one out of 30 genes, right, in this, in, in this family of human-specific genes, right? And so um, thanks to, to support from the Nomis Foundation, uh, uh, gracious support, this is a very risky project. Um, we, we have now the support to actually probe the function of uh, all the other genes, potentially. We're mostly interested in the genes that are expressed in neurons, right, in postmitotic neurons, because we think that that's really where the action is. Um, and I have a team of, of very talented graduate students and, and postdocs in the lab, uh, Carlos and Sergio, who are continuing to work on SRGAP2, um, and Eugenie and Martina, who are probing the function of some of those early other human-specific gene duplication using the same sort of approaches that, that I described. And finally, this is my last slide. 
I wanted to come back to the point you raised, right? Of the difficulty to <laughs> study the, the function of those genes only using mouse models, right? Our dream would be to actually, um, you know, pursue uh, the function of those genes in human neurons, right? But of course, this is very difficult to do, right? Up until very recently, uh, my my longtime uh, friend and colleague Pierre van der Hagen in in um, in Brussels in Belgium has developed this absolutely amazing in you know, a foundational paper uh, published in Nature in 2008. Um, they've uh, not only different managed to differentiate human ES cells into cortical neurons, but they um, by transplanting very few of those neurons into a mouse um, uh, cortex. They've shown that those neurons beautifully integrate, form this beautiful pyramidal morphology, ultimately uh, form spines. This is the only, to my knowledge, the only conditions in which human neurons actually form spines. They get connected with the, you know, 99.9% mm -hmm. of neurons around them. And even more amazingly, recently, they've shown that those human neurons integrated in, in the, this mouse brain, those very few neurons, actually develop um, completely normal functional properties. You can record visual response properties in the visual cortex uh, from those human neurons, uh, such as, you know, orientation selectivity or, or things, uh, things of, that, uh, of that realm, which is really remarkable. It's, it's a completely new opening for us, right? And so uh, in collaboration with Pierre and, and our colleague Jim Noonan also at, at Yale, we've been able to start asking the reverse question, right? We're basically knocking out those human specific genes in those human neurons and ask, what aspect of their functional integration, synaptic properties and response properties are, are dependent on those human specific genes. I think that the future is, is, is bright and, and, and I think pretty exciting in this context, right? So this I'll, is I'll, really I'll fantastic, I, yeah, Frank. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll stop here. I just wanna make sure I, I thank all the people that do this work. I have an absolutely amazing, amazingly talented group of, um, of, of people in, in the lab probing uh, some of those questions and some other questions I, I didn't have uh, time to, to, dwell, uh, to dwell on, including uh, some, some interesting questions about how those synaptic mechanisms are, um, uh, are affected in, in neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's. Um, and, um, and I think I mentioned some of the colleagues at, at ZI, Elizabeth Hillman, Randy Bruno, Ken Miller, Attila, of course, um, who you know helped in in major ways since we moved uh, to to Colombia to to propel basically the type of questions um, you know from the cellular and molecular level all the way to probing circuit function and, and behavior right and I'm I'm also very grateful of uh, 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 funding support I've been you know supported by NINDS for for a very long time um, and and more recently I mentioned you know this very general support from the Nomis Foundation for this uh, particular project on human specific um, modifiers. Yeah, this is this is really fantastic. And I hope you all can see there, uh, I mean, the, the people that are following this, how this could impact at, at both ends of our life, both narrow developmental disorders when we've been, uh, you know, forming our brains and, and these miswirings uh, can can lead to, to differences in, in learning and function early on. But then also later in life, when we have uh, situations like Alzheimer's and even normal uh, age-related changes in, in, in neuronal structure. So Frank, we have a few questions. Maybe I'll ask you a couple if you all don't mind. One is, so based on these, when, how do you think these, these would help us to modify actually brain structure using genetic techniques i mean are we are we close to that do you think it should be possible yeah i i, I think you know um there's been now that we understand some of the fundamental molecular mechanisms and right starting from genes um, that 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 contributes to uh brain wiring right in, in at least in uh in some some context um, it, it, it's definitely possible to, to imagine correcting some of the, the genetic mistakes, for example, using gene therapies, right? There, there's been some attempts uh, for this, you know, for, for absolutely devastating uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, mostly in the peripheral nervous system, right? For um, some, form, some forms of dystrophies, some, some forms of um, spinal muscular atrophy. 
to either genetically or uh, pharmacologically change gene expression in specific subtypes of neurons in order to correct um, to, to correct some of those effects. Of course, this is the future, um, and and you know for, for some uh, diseases it's, it's the present, um, and and it's an incredibly exciting time. I think that, you know it's early days, right? Because you you need uh, exquisite level of information on on how the genes are are functioning in order to 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 make the precise targeting, right? So there's a you know a lot of work by you know, hundreds of labs around the world to to to, to progress to. On, on on this cellular molecular mechanism mm -hmm. to the point where we can intervene, right? But it's true that we're almost overwhelmed by the 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 number of um, uh, gene mutations that have been mapped, right, in different disorders, starting from autism spectrum disorders, right, to schizophrenia, to to other neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric disorders. And so the, the the wealth of information we have at the genetic level, right, of what is is tremendous. What's lacking is understanding what those genes do. Right, if we want to intervene precisely, we need to do more work on that part. Right? Absolutely, and and uh, so one more specific question, Frank, that we have here from Mel Berkowitz was about the role of glia. So glia, the radio glia. Um, was supposed to be important for the migration of those cells. So when you found the repulsion and attraction, and uh, so what's the, what's the current view on the role of glia there? Yeah, uh, no, it's, it's actually a very interesting question. Um, so I, I, I briefly mentioned that this basic decision uh, of, of orienting the dendrite, which uh, the, the process that go up or the axon, the process that goes down while the cell is, is basically growing from both ends, right? Happens when the neurons engage uh, migration along the radial glial scaffold, right? On, on. And so, so far, we haven't really identified cues that um, come from radial glia, but it, it, you know, the current notion is that the, the glia basically uh, represents a scaffold for those neurons to migrate along. But it's also pretty clear that if you disrupt some of the extracellular cues um, that, um, that, that you know, uh, seem to pattern axon and dendrite growth, those neurons overcome the scaffold and basically detach from the radioglia and can, can show orientations in different directions. So, so you know, it, 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 it's, it's unclear if, if radioglia are pure sort of almost mechanical scaffold. There, there, there's well-known sort of um, you know, um, uh, cell adhesion interactions, right, between glia and neurons along that way. But it's pretty clear that neurons can respond to extracellular cues independent of radial glial as a scaffold, right? But um, yeah. remember also that, you know, one of the fascinating things about radial glia is that uh, it turns out, and that th that's a discovery that was uh, uh, made at Columbia, right, back then when um, uh, Arnold Christian was still here, is that radial glia are not only a scaffold, like was it was thought based on Pascal Rikis, beautiful work for, for um, you know, four decades, uh, that it was only a scaffold for, for the migration of those neurons. It turns out that they're the neural stem cells, right? The, those radial glial they're cells like, can... are the neural stem cells that by asymmetric division gives rise to post-mitotic neurons. And so, so th there's been an explosion of work, you know, from, from dozens and dozens of lab on trying to understand how those radial glia um, uh, are able to subserve these two functions, right? As a scaffold and as neural stem cells. And, there's a, really, and, really and you know, there's some work about the, the what makes human glia different than other glia, right? As well, <laughs> absolutely, like the neuron, absolutely. And there's, yeah. there's a lot of work. We, we've, we've sort of avoided working on this because since we published this first paper in 2012, most <laughs> of the work done on those human specific genes um, look at the, the function of some of those genes in radial glial um, exactly. neural stem cell function, right? As, and, as uh, to expand the pool of. So, this is one of the first ones, or probably the first, pardon my ignorance, where you use a single gene that's differentially experienced to change one specific neuron, the function in a sea of neurons that are not humanized, right? That's right. And, and that's fascinating. So, uh, look, we could stay here all day. I want to ask you a more, a bigger, maybe a big question. So 30 genes, right? 30 genes 
would make us different than, than our next, uh, you know, um, cousins, so to say. Uh, but yeah. do you think it's only 30 genes or also non-coding regions of the DNA? You, you, you think you're you would absolutely find right. differences there as There well? are basically thousands of other changes I, I haven't talked about. So there's basically, to simplify, two classes of genetic changes. There's this, um, right, that, that's the sort of the, the, the main workhorse of, of evolution. One is this gene duplication mechanism, right, where new genes appear. Some genes disappear, yeah. actually. There's a uh, uh, few, uh, but new genes appear and, and they acquire new function. There's a second class of changes that are not gene duplication, but single base pair or multiple base pair, mu uh, not mutations, but uh, changes, basically, that um, can change um, you know, either uh, coding sequences, right? That's that's also rare, but that happens. Or can change the type of mechanisms that Stavros, you know, was talking about the other day. The the, the type of um, non-coding regions in in the gene that regulates gene expression, that controls when and where genes are expressed. And so, part of this NOMIS-funded uh, project that that we have, um, my main colleague at Yale, Jim Noonan, that's what he studies. He studies the function of those so-called HARS, human accelerated region. So they, they mapped basically the about a thousand uh, changes um, of base pair changes that are only found in humans. So basically those are base pair <laughs> mutation, base, base pairs that are fixed throughout the entire uh, evolution in, in mammals or vertebrates, except in humans where, where those letters, those base pairs are changed. And so he's studying basically what impact does that have on gene expression, and we hope, you know, uh, ultimately on, on, uh, on, yeah, on, on brain is, development, right? So that, this that's is the... so, yeah, this is so fascinating. So look, we, let's schedule already a follow-up in a few years, because I mean, really, this is amazing. We're leaving the dream of Francois Jacob that we're trying to explain <laughs> from genetics. That would be a nice, the living be a, things. Uh, yeah, so thank you yeah, all absolutely. for joining us. Yeah, and thank you, Frank. This is this is fascinating. Uh, please, thank you, Ruby, all of and you. Thank you all for for staying so late. <laughs> yeah, and 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 join us back on March eighth next year. I hope you have uh, great holidays and a great new year. Uh, uh, join us uh, in Mar on March eighth uh, next year for our next event with Daphna Shohami, who's going to talk about uh, the role. Of, of the brain in learning and, and remembering. We hope uh, you stay well. Again, happy holidays and, and see you next year.